Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. Welcome to the Exercise Technique and Correction Series. We're gonna be taking a bunch of popular exercises, and if you have any you want us to do, please put them in the comments, and we're gonna be going through analyzing techniques, especially from the perspective of mistakes. Common mistakes people make on the exercises for hypertrophy training, and then we're gonna to try to solve each one of these problems and give you the tools to do your best possible job to get as jacked as humanly possible, because folks, what else is there? The stimulus to fatigue ratio in the gym in the real world. We've got other videos on RP and doing a bunch of math and trying to figure it out on a technical level, but in the gym, that's where you do most of the assessment for the stimulus to fatigue ratio. So first of all, what is the stimulus to fatigue ratio? It's the ratio of how much muscle growth an exercise or a certain technique of an exercise is stimulating relative to how much fatigue it's summing up. The more stimulus we can have, the more muscle growth we can have, the less fatigue we can have, first of all, we can be less fatigued, but second of all, you can just do that much more training and get that much more growth because the amount of total fatigue you can tolerate is limited. So if you have exercises and techniques that have a high ratio of stimulus to a low ratio of fatigue, you can do more of them, they're more sustainable, and you can get better overall muscle growth. So let's talk about the three proxies, the three factors we use in the gym to roughly judge stimulus, and then we'll talk about the three we use to roughly judge fatigue and tie it all in together. And once you're done watching this video, you'll be able to see any other video demonstrating techniques. You'll be able to take away the good stuff from the technique videos, of which we'll have a bunch for you eventually, but all the technique stuff is a little bit personalized. This is how you determine if the technique is good for you, if it's causing you a lot of stimulus and the lowest amount of possible fatigue. So let's get right into it. Stimulus first. Our first proxy of stimulus, and this isn't necessarily the most important one, just one of three equally important, is the mind-muscle connection. When we say mind-muscle connection, we don't just mean like perception of movement. We're like, okay, I have a bicep and I'm using it. Fine, who cares? That doesn't make you jacked. You don't stay at home and move your biceps and be like, yeah, definitely it's moving. That means I'm getting jacked. No, the mind-muscle connection or the context of muscle growth means one of two things and sometimes both. For very heavy weights, usually in the five to 10 rep range close to failure, there has to be a perception of a ton of tension being generated by and transmitted through the target muscle you want to grow. So for example, if I'm doing a bicep curl, you guys see these guns? If I'm doing a bicep curl and it's super heavy weight, I have to feel a ton of tension going through the bicep as I do the movement. One of the reasons why range of motion helps is at the stretch, a lot of times your ability to generate tension and have it really cause growth is really high and you can feel that deep in a stretch with a bench press. You can also feel the pecs working, so on and so forth. So if you're doing a bicep curl and you want the biceps to grow and you're doing it heavy, you feel a ton of tension in your forearms, maybe some in your shoulders, but you really don't feel a ton in your bicep, you can't be honest and say that, it might not be stimulating bicep growth as much as it could be. What about high reps? Sets of 20 to 30, when you're really banging them out, yeah, you're gonna feel some tension, but it's never gonna feel like a lot because it's lightweight, it's 20 to 30 rep range weight. In that case, we can see we have a high mind-muscle connection when we feel the burn a whole lot in the target muscle. So if you're doing a set of 25 or 30 in the dumbbell curl, for example, that's gonna be my uh, exercise for demo here for the whole rest of the time. If you're doing a super high rep set close to failure like it should be, towards the end, if you've got a burn here in your forearms, you've got a burn in your delts or even you know the side of your shoulders or something like that, maybe even your traps from holding the dumbbell, but you don't have a deep burn in the bicep you're targeting, that's not the greatest thing in the world. For a great workout in the target muscle with heavy weights, you want a perceived muscle ripping tension, like holy crap. Imagine doing a deep leg press, what your quads feel like, like, oh my God, they're, I can for sure tell something's happening. And for high reps, it's okay if you don't perceive a ton of tension at any one time because the weight is low, but what you definitely want is a perception of, oh my God, my biceps are burning off my body. You want to drop the weight at the end of the set, <laughs> get the metabolites out of my muscles, they're hurting me. That's a good thing in the target muscle. If an exercise or a certain way of doing it doesn't allow you to feel the burn or the tension in the target muscle, you gotta look for either better exercises or another way of doing it. Maybe 
if you grab the dumbbell like this and you're doing biceps, you don't really feel it a ton your biceps. Maybe if you grab it like this and it tries to rotate internally and you peek it at the top with your pinky, that actually involves some of the supination effects of the bicep. Maybe for you, that'll really make you feel the bicep much more in one of those two ways, or maybe both, moderate reps, sets of 10 to 20, you'll feel some combination of high tension and the metabolite burn. To the extent that you feel either or both of them, that's a great thing, and if you don't, you might not be onto something very good. Next. So that's point number one for stimulus. Next, stimulus is really super straightforward. It's the pump. How much does the exercise or the technique give you a pump in the target muscle? If you're doing some kind of weird new curl that's like this, or you gotta like twist the dumbbell, and someone after four or five sets, someone's like, you got a bicep pump, and you're like, not really, that's not a great sign. But if you figured out a technique or an exercise that gets you a huge pump after several sets, the fewer sets it takes you to get a pump, the better, you're probably onto some good muscle growth. So if an exercise gives you a great pump, you're probably onto something. A quick thing is like, well, what about heavy weights? They don't really give you a pump. They do if you're predominantly fast twitch muscle fiber in that area, very likely. So a lot of times you get a better pump in your chest when it's really fast twitch by doing sets of eight and 10 in the bench press and dumbbell press than you would by doing sets of 30 in the cable fly, which is for some of you, but just not doing anything but make your pecs tired. So you don't have to go for the pump at all times. If you have a high level of tension perception, the pump is just part of the equation, but the better the pump, usually, everything else being equal, the more muscle you're probably gonna stimulate growth, and the fewer sets you can do that in, the better. Those are two factors so far for the stimulus of muscle growth. The third and final proxy for stimulus is muscle disruption to the target muscle. What do we mean by muscle disruption? Three things. After a hard workout, even during a hard workout, your muscles that you're targeting, especially towards the end, should feel strange. Something should be off, okay? If you do a bunch of barbell curls or dumbbell curls and you don't get a huge stimulus in the bicep and someone's like, how do your biceps feel? And you're like, it's totally fine. Then there's a good chance you didn't stimulate a whole lot of growth. But if after a bicep workout, someone's like, hey, how do your biceps feel? You're like, I don't know, man. It feels sort of strange. The kind of wobbly, shaky a little bit. The muscle feels weird. That's probably a really, really good thing. Point. Sub point number two on the stimulus of what is considered a muscle disruption if you experience local target muscle weakness, right? Like if you're trying to go down the stairs, you just did quads and you're like, oh my God, it's hard to go down the stairs, hard to go up the stairs. That's probably a good thing. If you do a super hard quad workout and you could hop up the stairs normally, eh, it probably wasn't that hard, probably wasn't that stimulative. Lastly, and this doesn't have to happen, is some degree of muscle soreness. We don't mean DOMS. We mean after a quad workout, for example, after a bicep workout, you're brushing your teeth and you're like, ugh, something that just doesn't feel right. It feels like maybe a little bit of connective tissue kind of feels sort of crackly, you know, it feels tight. That's just a very mild form of soreness. Or it could be a little soreness at the extreme ends of the tissue or somewhere in the middle, and it can range all the way up to delayed onset muscle soreness, pretty profound, painful to the touch. It doesn't have to be delayed onset muscle soreness, but it should probably be like your muscle doesn't feel 100% hours and or days after. If you can check all those three boxes, great, but even just some of them is good. So if we can check those three boxes of stimulus, we have a mind-muscle connection, which means high perception of tension and or burn. We have a pump and the muscle has clearly been disrupted. To the extent that happens, that's great for stimulus. But hold on, we still have half the equation left, fatigue. Fatigue isn't a great thing because it prevents us from being able to put in more stimulus. Every time we stimulate in the gym, it comes with a certain fatigue cost. Our goal is to minimize the fatigue cost without touching the stimulus. That's a really important point because if we just go to the least fatiguing exercises or ways of doing things, you'd be in here doing curls like this with no range of motion, no weight, be like, sweet, no fatigue, great, but you didn't get any stimulus either. So fatigue is okay. And in fact, sometimes it has to come with the training, especially in hardcore movements, but there shouldn't be any excessive fatigue. How do we measure fatigue? Also three ways. First one, joint and connective tissue disruption or perception of damage. So if you're doing bicep curls and every single rep your elbow hurts and every single other rep it gets worse and worse and you're like, oh, oh, something's up with my elbow. And someone's like, don't worry about it, brother, it's just the cost of being the boss. You're like, ah, I don't know if that's really sustainable, right? So if you find out that curling like this really hurts your elbows, but curling like that is super totally awesome for your elbows and doesn't feel like a thing, if the stimulus is equivalent between them, you wanna go to what hurts your joints and connective tissues less. Okay, we don't come into the gym to hurt our joints. Sometimes the joints won't feel amazing during training and after training, 
that's okay, but our number one priority is do this as little as possible. Anytime you're figuring your squat stance width, your deadlift stance width, your bench press grips, pull-ups, anything and everything, you have to watch for your joints and connective tissues to make sure you pick the grips that are, you know, the most charitable to them. Second way to judge fatigue. We have joint and connective tissue pain or, or distress. The less, less of that, the better. The second one is rating of perceived exertion. If we have two exercises that are equally stimulative, but one is way harder to do than the other, that systemic fatigue is gonna spill over and affect all of your other training is not a good thing. Psychological fatigue is absolutely a type of systemic fatigue. So if you could do full range of motion squats, which aren't terribly difficult, they really mess up your quads, they're not really hard to do because it's not a ton of weight on the bar, you don't have to super psych up. Okay, that's so this much stimulus and you know this much fatigue. What if you do like partial stance squats with like 600 pounds stuff? The bar doesn't even move until you psych up. Every set drains you like crazy. The perceived exertion is just un unreal. If it's worth the stimulus, that's great. Do your bent rows, do your deadlifts, do your presses, do the hard shit that drains the fuck out of you, but it's gotta be worth the stimulus. If you can't check the, boss, the boxes of tons of tension, tons of burn, tons of pump, and tons of muscle disruption, if just your joints hurt, and just your brain is zapped, and you can't even tell what you trained, not a great exercise. Lastly, another measure of systemic fatigue is a given exercise that you do for a muscle group, how much does it affect strength levels of an unrelated muscle group? For example, if I do a set of rack deadlifts for my back, crazy amount of weight, really shitty technique. I get a certain amount of stimulus for my back, okay, sweet, and a ton of fatigue. After I do those rack deadlifts, someone could be like, all right, it's time to train chest, or it's time to train you know, your uh, quads or something like that, something that was minimally or not involved in the actual movement you did. What is your performance going to be like on that movement? That's the big question. If you can do a set, four sets of barbell bent rows, get a great back pump, jump into chest training and knock chest out no problem with almost no decrease in performance, that's great, that's a very little spillover of fatigue, you're growing your whole body no problem. But if you do a set of shitty rack deadlifts with poor technique, put a trillion pounds on the bar, completely drained afterwards, and your performance on chest suffers a ton, that's an indicator of high systemic fatigue, which is gonna mess up the rest of your program. Even if you wanna keep training that muscle group later, it's already super tired. You're just not getting a lot done. So the whole conclusion here is, as much of the three factors of stimulus that we can have, the more, the better. The less of the fatigue factors we can have without sacrificing stimulus factors, the better. Because an exercise like squatting or barbell pressing, bench pressing, bent row, those exercises a lot of times are very fatiguing, but they're also super, super stimulative. When you choose your exercises, go with the ones that have the most stimulus and the least relative fatigue. And anytime you try to customize your technique on an exercise, which should be always because it's for you that you're doing the exercise, anytime you customize technique, you should be looking for the technique that gives you the most stimulus and the least fatigue on all the factors we described. The one that gives you the best tension, the best burn, the best pumps, messes up the target muscle the most, hurts your joints and connective tissues the least, doesn't drain you for no good reason, and leaves you able to do a pretty good job at other unrelated muscle groups later. If you can get all those factors into one, those exercises are the best, those techniques are the best, and any time you see any technique tips, including the ones we'll be offering on this channel, make sure to try them, but pick the ones that work best for you and make your stimulus to fatigue ratio as high as it can possibly be. Boy, did I overdo that last one, your SFR. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. Enjoy our technique videos, enjoy the sample workouts, enjoy all the lectures, get bigger and stronger, because that's fun. See you next time.